I'm sorry to interrupt the bubble of conversation and things, but we would uh, dearly like to get started. So, Vice-Chancellor, honoured guests, colleagues and students, as the current director of CES, it's a huge pleasure to um, open the fifth annual Roland Cliff Lecture. Roland was uh, the inspirational founder of CES in 1992 and its first director. We're absolutely delighted that Roland is here uh, and die with us again uh, for this premiere event in CES's calendar. We're also especially delighted that Steve Waygood uh, is our Roland Clift lecturer, because Steve is an alumnus of CES and a brilliant example of the outstanding contributions that CES alumni and staff make to advancing sustainability around the world. Steve is obviously also a very courageous person, not because of you, the audience, but because he will be giving this lecture in front of his two PhD supervisors. <laughs> Roland himself and Walter Wehrmeyer here. And I think in a great example of how things can go full circle, it's also fitting that Walter is going to give the vote of thanks at the conclusion of Steve's lecture and host the question and answer session. So, without further ado, it remains to me to invite our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Max Liu, uh, to welcome Steve to the university to give the fifth annual Roland Cliff Lecture. Thank you. <laughs> Max. Good evening, uh, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. First, I acknowledge uh, Roland uh, and Dai. Welcome back to campus. Um, and also, a great uh, pleasure to welcome back Dr. Steve Waygold as uh, one of our distinguished alumni. I think I understand it's from economics and from uh, the CES <laughs> as well. Um, so Dr. Wei Wigood is the Chief Responsible Investment Officer, and that's a very good title, at uh, Avia Investors. And those of you who haven't seen his, uh, haven't listened to him uh, on uh, TED, he gave a TED talk called Responsible Investment which has provided an excellent and accessible, inspiring framework about how we can all influence the restructuring of finance and to invest in our future sustainability. And given what's going on now with Brexit, I think perhaps we need another talk about responsible government, <laughs> uh, indeed. So I use the word accessible, I emphasize on the accessible word because I believe that to ensure a sustainable future for us all, everyone in this room and beyond have a role to play. And we all can make a difference in very small or in grand ways as individuals and as institutions. But yet, issues of environmental sustainability are not for the faint-hearted. And these challenges really require a capacity for and a commitment to finding solutions that may well redefine companies, industries, economies, and sectors. Old habits die hard, and new habits demand tenacity, imagination, and influence, and persistence. More than that, this mission requires the faith all of us to have the faith in humanity's, humanity's willingness to change and expand beyond our individual self-interest. Unquestionably, the stakes are high. Sustainability will become more and more important going forward. We will have to be built in everything we do. In the university, I think we need to build this in our curriculum, whether you are engineer or you are economist or social scientist. It will demand a great deal from our leaders, ourselves, and citizens alike. We are immensely fortunate to have people like Dr. Weigold to help us find the way for a better future. Dr. Weigold joins the august company of past Roland Cliff Lectures. I have had the personal pleasure to attend the previous two who have illuminated such topics such as energy security, cyber terrorism, the circular economy, 
and world development within the planetary boundaries. We are privileged to have insights into current thinking and the thought leaders of the thought leaders on such a multidisciplinary uh, area. And, and it offers a multidisciplinary approach to the industrial ecology and the sustainable systems. Environment and sustainability as a discipline now comprehends topics of enormous importance and will offer solutions and ideas that must stretch to the task. And of course, in this context, we are very proud of our Center for Environment and Sustainability, of whose work is closely aligned with the university's broader research agenda on sustainability, urban living, and among others. So work in these areas is critical to finding solutions to our global challenges, as well as measuring the environmental impact of the development and how we manage that impact. So therefore, this particular Roland Cliff Lecture is highly relevant and important to the mission of this university, and that is to make a positive difference in shaping the world through education and research. So on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Go Wago to give the, Ro Roland, the fifth Roland Cleave Lecture. <laughs> Steve. Thank you. Over to you. What a huge honour it is to be here, and thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction, Vice-Chancellor. Thank you. Uh, Roland, uh, it's wonderful to see you, and, and Walter, you too. It's an honour. Thank you for extending the invitation to be here. Um, you both will remember um, the Viva for possibly one thing only. At the very beginning of my Viva, you can imagine how nervous I was. The fire alarm went off just as I was about to answer the first question. Now, put yourself in my shoes. I, I was panicking because it was the Viva. The fire alarm went off. And Roland and Volta were both incredibly kind to put me at my ease and say, don't worry, this is fine. We can reconvene. We won't let this not happen. It will happen. And they looked after me over the 20 minutes that then we had to exit the building and then have some chit-chat and then reconvene later. Now, what you both won't realise is that all the while I was thinking that I knew you had another meeting in two hours, and it meant that <laughs> that, that 20 minutes was 20 minutes less grilling. <laughs> what you also won't realise is that I still owe a friend 10 pounds for setting off that fire alarm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, that isn't true. Um, so what I want to do with the course of the next 45 minutes or so is to, give, to start big in terms of what's wrong with capitalism, and then go into the details about how it works a bit, and then start stepping back again to say, how would we restructure it so that it was more sustainable? So that's the kind of narrative art you should expect. Normally, I prefer uh, interaction with the audience so that we have a conversation <coughs> rather than a, uh, a lecture, but this A is a lecture and B is being filmed. So we're gonna do 45 minutes and then Q&A. So if you do have any questions, please, Ask them, but please ask them at the end, at which point we're going to do three or four at a time, uh, and then I'll take them together and answer them, and we've got half an hour, or, and, and I'm sticking around for a bit after if you want any more time. But, so that, that's the kind of the broad arc. Um, and I'm going to be talking about, can capitalism deliver sustainable development? My broad argument is, yes, it can, but no, it isn't right now. So just to get that out there, the biggest contemporary market failure is a lack of sustainability in the capital markets. And I will explain what I mean by that. Now, these logos will be well known to most of you in the room. Most of you will know most of the companies that are behind me. All of them have come to us as a fund manager in the last five, ten years, asking for your money or for those of whom, we have 33 million clients, 17 million in the UK, some of you will be Aviva's clients. For those of you whose pension scheme we're running, these are the institutions and literally thousands of others that are coming to us asking 
us to either lend them money in the form of a corporate bond or invest in their security in the form of an equity. Now, I'd like, you, you all care about sustainability. I know that, you're here. I'm sure many of you will have investments, whether they're with us or not. And I'd just like to do it, have a little bit of fun. Can we have a show of hands for, there's, there's, a, there's a multiple series of questions here. I'd like you to put your hand up if you know what's in your pension scheme and keep your hand up. What investments do you have in your pension savings or investments? Put your hands up now and keep them up, please. Okay, that's, that's only, only a few, say 10%. Please keep them up. Can you keep your hand up if you know how your votes at the AGMs of the companies you own were used on your behalf? Okay, there's a couple of you, and I'm very pleased to see those hands still up. Now, what I want you to do, so there's, just for the benefit of the film, there's a few people only left with their hands up. And this is in a room full of people who are obviously interested in capitalism and clearly, clearly extremely concerned about sustainability. Now, 33 million customers, we vote nearly 50,000 resolutions with the approaching half a trillion of assets under management that we run. And we only get a few dozen questions each year about how we voted these shares. And hardly any of those questions are, have we promoted more sustainable business practices? Now, since 2001, we have been trying to do that. We were the first fund manager in the world to integrate climate change into our voting policy back in 2001. But by and large, by and large, the individual doesn't care. There is very little demand for sustainable investing. Why? <coughs> Who was taught finance at school? Put your hands up. Wow. Keep your hands up. Were any of you taught sustainability and how it relates to finance? Yet yeah, all of you did a course on citizenship at some point or something related to that. Why don't we? Everyone, every teacher wants every student to be a pensioner at some point or at least be, be looked after somehow. But yet it isn't part of the national curriculum. How AGMs work, full stop, isn't in the national curriculum and how sustainability relates to it too is not part of the national curriculum. Now, I think sustainable finance needs to be a national curricula around the world so that individuals, citizens, are equipped with the ability to put fund managers under pressure and ensure that the work that we do with your money finances the future you wish to retire into. After all, it's your money. It's your vote. You should care. These companies shape your world. They shape your, your transport, your home, your food, your holiday, one or two of them, the news you might read, your healthcare, they shape your world. Companies shape your world. If you've never thought of that fact, it's an interesting one to think of. Yet, if you've invested in them, you can use your influence to shape what they do in your name. And I work on a team, there's 17 people in my team, whose job it is to try and shape, use your assets, <coughs> allocate them into the right kind of thing, factor in sustainability risks, and then use our influence to effect change. <coughs> And the institutional demand, I'm very pleased to say, is shot up, but the individual demand remains woeful, a, a fraction of a percent of the market. So there are three main failures of capitalism that I want to take you through this evening. The first failure is a failure of capital markets and particularly financial advisors to consider your personal ethics in the way that they offer you financial advice. Going to have a bit more fun. Could you put your hands up if you were asked about your ethics when you were approaching a financial advisor and you didn't choose that financial advisor because they were an ethical IFA? Could you put your hands up if ethics came into the conversation? That's great. That's more than normal. That's, that's not bad, but it's still around 10%. And at the moment, investment advisors, IFAs, or anyone, or the institutional ones and the retail ones, the ones that advise individuals, they're under no obligation to ask you if you have any ethics that you'd like to have considered in the way that they advise you. They need to know whether you've got any beneficiaries, they need to know how long you're investing for, they need to know your risk appetite, they need to know a few other things too. It's called Know Your Client, KYC. It's to make sure they're not mis-selling products and they have to prove there's a paper trail that the product is suitable. At the moment, there's no requirement on them to think about your ethics. So is there any coincidence that you probably think that finance is unethical? Ethics hasn't entered the debate yet. 
at the individual point of interface. First failure. Second failure. The way the markets are structured, and I'll take you through market structure, if you only take one thing away from this that you didn't have before, I'd like you to take away a better understanding of how your money <coughs> flows through a series of intermediaries. It flows through trustees of pension schemes who use a an investment consultant to choose a fund manager who buys and sells securities on a stock exchange that were brought to the market by an investment bank that then ends up in a company, the money flows into a company that then does things, that shapes your world, hopefully makes money and returns you a dividend or share price improvement. And in returning you that money, it gives you more money to then invest back into the system. This is how the microeconomy relates to the macroeconomy economy and should facilitate growth. I'll take you through that with a diagram a little later. But the incentives of that system and the vision they have, three years in that system is considered to be a long time frame. It's long term, three years. I wouldn't imagine any of you thinks that three years is really long term. I mean, obviously, if you work in investment, it's an eon. But three years in the real world is not long term. And as a consequence, the, the people who run your money are putting pressure on these companies to not invest in things that have got a long-term payback. Let me put that slightly differently. It's very difficult for the executives of a, of a company like this that's, put mon that's got lots of shareholders. It's difficult for them to invest in training, workforce training, invest in their brand, invest in research and development, things that are going to cost in the next few quarters that will only return benefits in the next few years. The short-termism of the system means the system is failing companies themselves. So those are the two failures, I said three. A failure of ethics, a failure to look after the long-term future of companies. The third failure, and this is the really big one, the one planet boundary condition that you all care about so much, if I can call it the one planet boundary condition here, I'm sure you all are familiar with what I mean, is utterly ignored through the way that valuations are structured. If it is an externality, it means literally it is external to the cash flows of the business. If, is it, if it is external to the cash flows of the business, we have to ignore it in the way that we do valuation or we misprice the security, at least the way that others are going to trade it. So we have millions of investors making billions of investment decisions on trillions of assets under management every year, all of which ignore that one planet boundary condition until it hits the cash flows of the company. So the three failures that you've, you will hear me canter through, ethics, lack of long-termism, and a lack of sustainability. Now this is the ethical point that I made earlier. I don't know how many of you realise that there are still today companies, about 30 companies in the world, that are involved in making cluster munitions. I don't imagine any of you would want your money to be invested in cluster munitions. You have to actually voice that at the point of sale with your IFA if that's what you want to avoid. As it happens, I work for a company on its own assets under management has chosen to not own these things, not own cluster munitions and landmines. We're not alone, actually quite a few others have done that now too. But what about tobacco? There's only 30 companies involved in this. Tobacco is actually, if you're not going to own tobacco, you're then into an environment where you're possibly going to reduce your returns. But how many of you really want to benefit from your friends and family killing themselves. Now, you might wish to be free to choose to smoke yourself. It's a libertarian view, but you're also free to choose not to own the companies if you were given a question, if you were asked. Now, that's the ethical piece a bit more in a bit more detail. Now, there are some market failures, uh, and you'll hear me talk about market failure quite a bit this evening, there are some market failures that are so profound they will ultimately come back to hurt the ability of the market to generate returns over the very long term. <coughs> Climate change is, of course, an example of that. Now, this study cost half a million pounds. Uh, Aviva worked with a few other foundations to fund the Economist Intelligence Unit to do it. We, did, we, asked, we, we kicked it off in 2014, published it halfway through 2015 in order to influence the Paris Agreement positively. And it was used... Uh, by a number of people like Anne Gurria, uh, the Secretary General of the OECD, and Mark Carney, of course, the Governor of the Bank of England and the Chair of the Financial Stability Board. It was cited by them in the Paris Conversations because it estimates the value at risk 
associated with climate change. By value at risk, we mean the actual cost, not the economic cost, but the amount of money that would be wiped off the stock of capital. And broadly speaking, there's about 300 trillion in the global capital markets, broadly speaking. I have to speak broadly because no one actually measures it. Phenomenally interestingly, there isn't an institution that actually is monitoring the current value of the total stock of, of, of assets under management, but we know it's about 300 trillion. We modelled two, three, four, five, and six degrees of change, climate change, uh, and tried to establish what would be the value at risk. And the worst figure is at six degrees by 2100, the present value in 2015 of a six degree change, according to the EIU, using government discount rates, sorry for all the caveats, but it's an academic audience, we would wipe off 43 trillion worth of global capital, 43 trillion at six degrees. And actually, I think that's a significant understatement. At four degrees, the business model of insurance falls over because the, the economic, the cost to you of your premium is actually so high because the floods happen so much more often, the fires happen so much more often, or the crops fail so much more often. The economic cost of the insurance, be, you become disinterested in insuring because it comes almo becomes almost the same as the economic loss. So if insurance tips over at four degrees, I think that's an understatement. So I wanted to give you a sense of how the environment relates to your pocket, not just the penguins and the pandas, but your pocket. And the motivation for doing this work was so that we could go to the politicians and say, as Aviva, we are really worried about climate change for our shareholders and for our clients, not just for the moral and environmental reasons, the intrinsic reasons too. So there's a, this is a good news graph, you might be pleased to hear. Um, the underlying line comes from the United Nations Environment Programme that have been doing an amazing inquiry into sustainable finance in the last few years. They've been looking into the relationship between capitalism and sustainability and looking and recommending a whole series of policy interventions. If you've never read it, I highly recommend the UNEP inquiry into sustainable finance, any one of their reports, particularly the last one, because it synthesised them all. But this, is, this diagram shows the number of policy interventions that governments have made and intergovernmental institutions have made over the duration that it covers. And it's no coincidence then that since the financial crisis, and a little bit before, you can see a huge acceleration in the policy focus in this space. It is genuinely the case today, and, and I doubt any of you will really be aware of this, but in the last 18 months, we've seen the Financial Stability Board that exists to make sure there's no more financial crunches, <coughs> to some extent. We've seen the FSB take this to the top table, sustainability. Two months ago, we saw the Secretary General of the United Nations launch the UN Sustainable Finance Strategy. Earlier this year, we had Juncker and Dombrovskis, Valdis Dombrovskis, launch the European Commission's Sustainable Finance Action Plan. The UK government has issued a Green Finance Action Plan, Norway, Singapore, Canada. At the governmental level, we're seeing more action now, more consideration and, and conversation of sustainability and how it relates to, to capitalism than I have seen in the preceding 20 years combined. And I've now worked in this area for about 23 years. So it, it is absolutely at the top table. And I take that as a huge win, if you like, for what we collectively stand for. We are changing the conversation. I'll be at the G20 in two weeks from now, and we will be tabling action that we want the G20 to take. We'll be meeting heads of state. Um, I had a meeting with Theresa May and Shinzo Abe and a few others um, at the UN Secretary General. I'm not name dropping, I'm sim well I am. I'm simply <laughs> trying to say that there are um, a lot of people now talking about this stuff, including the Pope. The Pope at Aldo C in 2015, he also has been interested in this. So people are beginning to at least confront the fact that capitalism is unsustainable. I'm not pretending for a second that they've made substantive change anywhere near sufficient, but one of the changes that you'll see from the, this one, if the pointer works, here we go. That's, if you could read it, that was, that's the European Commission Sustainable Finance High Level Expert Group. It predated the action plan. There are dozens of recommendations for change in there. The most important one to my mind, and there are other really big ones too. Every financial advisor 
across Europe from the end of next year, a $2 trillion market, is going to have to ask their clients whether they have any ethics or sustainability preferences they would like to have considered in the advisory process. I think that is going to drive a revolution. We were the ones that were arguing for it. I was on the high-level expert group. We've got it through to a rewrite of something called the Market and Financial Information Directive. It almost certainly will come through. It's still yet going through the final, um, it's called Trilog. Um, but if it happens, you'll all be familiar with nudge as a concept and the auto-enrolment in your pension schemes is to nudge people into making a decision. It is a colossal nudge in the direction of sustainable finance. We know that when people are asked, do you want to benefit from your friends and family killing themselves? We know what they say. Obviously, that's not going to be the question. <laughs> in fact, there's going to be a world of confusion as people try and work out what the question is. But we know that people, generally speaking, when asked, want to do the right thing. And most people go into that financial advisory environment confused about finance, not knowing what to say, which is why ethical funds are less than a fraction of a percent of the overall market. Most people, in fact, if you ask a financial advisor for an ethical fund, they'll try and talk you out of it because of the financial performance considerations, which we can sh I'll show you in a minute. So that's the good news. There's further good news. There's been an absolutely huge escalation in institutional demand, not individual demand, which is you as individuals, but institutions. There's something called the UN Principles for Responsive Investment, which was written back in 2006. I was very proud to be part of the process. We helped shape it and were a, a founder signatory to it. And it asks everyone who signs up to check that their fund managers are doing a good job in this area, or at least pretending to do a good job in this area. We now today, in the last two years, every single one of the consultant intermediated tender documents, every single one of the big institutional clients in the UK asks us what are we doing on environmental, social and corporate governance issues. There's been 120% growth in the number of questionnaires that we're getting that ask questions in this area and 680% growth in the number of questions they're asking. A very large corporate, FTSE 100 corporate, their pension scheme last month asked us 64 questions about the environmental, social and corporate governance world. That is real demand. Whether you knew it or not, there is a revolution underway. On your behalf, probably without your knowledge. Now I'm beginning to see a lot of fund managers begin to compete with their marketing material on this basis. It's a problem. If you wanted chocolate or coffee that's got good standards, you ask for... Sorry? Fair trade, thank you. You should all have said fair trade, because <laughs> you're in this area. Now if you want a pension or an ISA or some savings that are, are good standards, there isn't one you can ask for. It doesn't exist. So why isn't there a standard? So it's easy to make lots of claims. It's easy to make lots of claims. There's a huge amount of smoke and mirrors. Got BlackRock here arguing for uh, campaigning for firefighters. Most of you would never have heard of BlackRock a few years ago. Maybe some of you have now. They own 5% of everything. They're that big. They are, they, they, are, they are the most powerful financial institution in the fund management space, bar none. How many of you knew that? Could you put your hand up? <laughs> That's good. Good. That's a change on a, on a year and a half ago, uh, where none of, I, I would have thought many of you would never have heard of them. Isn't it? I would have thought most of you have heard of Larry Fink because of his change in, in tone in the last few years, in terms of his letter that now goes to companies to say that we think sustainability is important. I would imagine that's the case anyway. I, I went to Geneva a couple of weeks ago, and there, there are, for those of you that have not been, there's a travelator, and you, when going from the plane to the passport control, you pass 12 adverts, six either side. Obviously, lots of them are watches and, 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 and jewellery, eight of them, in fact. Four of them were from Swiss banks. All four of them were claiming to be a responsible, sustainable bank looking after future generations. These are Swiss banks. <laughs> If they can claim it. <coughs> so what I wanted to give you, this is a little bit tedious, I guess, because you're going to have to read some of it. I'm not going to read it to you. You can all read. I hope you can read it from the back. But in terms of the strategic responses that finance can have to this broad sustainable challenge, there are broadly four different strategies of responsible investment. 
the first that we put up there is ESG integration, environmental, social and corporate governance integration. Environmental is obvious, social is obvious. Corporate governance means how is the guiding mind of the company controlling the strategy, the policy framework? Um, are they making sure that they are um, delivering a, uh, a profitable strategy for shareholders? Corporate governance makes sure that the board has the interests of the shareholders at the heart of the business, correcting some of the principal agent problems that exist in this space. Now, ESG integration simply means looking at the environmental, social and corporate governance data that's out there and exploiting any market inefficiency and pricing it so that you can better price the security and make more money. Those of you that believe that markets are perfectly efficient believe that when a company discloses any data anywhere, it's instantaneously picked up in the, sh in the share price. That's what the efficient market hypothesis strong form holds. Now, I don't believe in the strong form of efficient markets. I think it's ludicrous. And it's that belief, the inefficiency in the market in analysing this information. There's a whole world of inefficiencies in the ESG space. I'm going to say ESG from now on. There's, an in it, there's a whole world of opportunities to exploit alpha generating opportunities. So that's one. And it's amoral. It's not for any ethical reason. It's just to make more money. Second one, active ownership again, is becoming more and more common. There are shareholder activists, there are people that talk about engagement. In the UK, they've got a stewardship code. All of it means being a responsible owner of a business, using your voice to promote change that's positive for the business and perhaps for society and the environment beyond. So you can think of active ownership as using your voice. The negative screening bit here, and there are various versions of it, negative screening is about using the exit, not the voice. It means never owning tobacco, for example, or never owning pharmaceuticals if you worry about animal testing. Now, the problem with negative screening is if you want to change the world and you want to improve the situation, perhaps the best way of doing that is to be a share owner, I believe. And I, that belief is based on experience. So if you walk away from a company before you've ever had the conversation, or in fact you never walk towards the company because you can never own it, ethical investing in the form of negative screening, whilst it will keep your conscience clean, makes very little difference to the cause that you're, you care about. I'm not saying you shouldn't buy an ethical fund, because also in doing that you're signalling to the market that you are a concerned consumer, and it's for you to make a decision, it's your money. But I am saying that when you do avoid things, you're not going to be able to change them. Now, there are areas where it's absurd to think you could engage with a company and change it. One of them is if you care about the fact that tobacco kills half the people that use it in the way it's intended to be used, you can't really go to a tobacco company and say, stop manufacturing cigarettes. It's the core problem is their core business. So there are areas where negative screening really is, perhaps, if you care about these things, your only strategy. It's for you to voice that. But there's a whole world of other reasons why... Oh, I forgot one. So the fourth strategy is the opposite of negative screening, but means something very different for your portfolio. The fourth strategy is called impact investing, or uh, there are other phrases for it, sustainability-themed investing. It means that you proactively want to steer your money into solutions for a problem. That could be education, waste management, uh, renewable energy. Um, you want a portfolio of stocks that have positive impact on the planet and the people on it. So, Impact investing originally came from Rockefeller 13, 14 years ago, and they meant impact investing was investing in social enterprises. <coughs> it's become used and abused by lots of financial institutions since then, to the point that you probably wouldn't even recognise that definition. Now, I also wanted to use this opportunity to put to bed the concept that environmental, social and governance issues don't affect share price. I'm sure none of you think that, but these are all companies that have got something wrong in the last few, uh, 15 years or so. Some of them are iconically wrong, Enron, for example, or BP with Macondo. Um, some of them less so. But all of them, it's been an environmental, social or governance failing that's led to significant, uh, significantly material share price reductions over the, over the year that the issue happened. Enron, it wiped the business out. It also took their auditor with them, Arthur Anderson. Who's heard of them anymore today that wasn't around in 2001? So this, this stuff, looking 
after environmental, social and governance issues as a company is good for the business. And in the academic and the broker literature, that is borne out by the research. I'm not going to run through it all now, but there are literally thousands of studies and some meta-analyses that look at what is the preponderance of the academic literature telling us. And by and large, it concludes that looking after your employees, looking after your customers, ensuring that you're compliant and not abusing local communities is a good business model. Who would have thought? <laughs> Why is it even asked? Why do people ask us to prove that integrating ESG leads to enhanced returns? Surely it should be the other way around. Anyway, the answer is yes. So gonna, this is one last step down and then we're going to step back. So at my team, we engage, as I mentioned, with, we, we vote on 50,000 resolutions. We, vote, we engage with about 1,300 companies a year uh, and we attend, we don't actually attend many of the shareholder meetings. We meet with companies in advance of the AGM. Um, and we, we try and we embed in our assets under management, environmental, social and governance issues across all the asset classes that my team works with, which includes private equity, sovereign, ec um, listed equity, corporate debt uh, and infrastructure. Um, I think I said property if I didn't, real estate. Um, a couple of examples of some work that we've done. Many of you will have seen the debacle recently with Unilever and whether it wanted to move to Rotterdam. Uh, we were one of the most outspoken investors saying that is against shareholders interests might be in the interests of the board might be in the interests of certain individuals on the board but it's not in the interests of shareholders and they've stopped that move now I, I don't want to criticize Unilever too much because they are superb at their sustainability work particularly the environmental side not so much the social but particularly the environmental side uh, and Paul Polman visionary leader who deserves huge credit for the work that they've been doing on sustainability McDonald's um, we engaged with, in their supply chain, they're using a lot of antibiotics, which is reducing, where is increasing antimicrobial resistance and is leading to superbugs. If you go into a hospital, you're now worried about catching a superbug, which is a, 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 you've got something wrong with you that can't be treated by these antibiotics anymore. These superbugs are now killing about 7 million people a year. And an ex, um, one of the previous students of the University of Surrey, Lord Jim O'Neill, did a study a few years ago estimating the financial consequences by 2050 if we don't deal with antimicrobial resistance. It would erode 100 trillion from the global value of the economy. The drugs won't work anymore. You will go to the dentist, you might get an infection, and you might die. It goes back to the 1910s, 1915s. Sorry to be quite so glib, but anyway. McDonald's, we engaged with them and we encourage them to stop using human, the, the, the most crucial antibiotics in the, in, in the, that humanity need in their supply chain for chicken and beef, and they made a commitment. We, we weren't the only ones to engage, but we were among others to engage, and I'm very pleased that they made the commitment. There is a report on our website if you want to see more, um, just the, the annual review of my team. But the point I'm making is you can use investor voice to effect big change. Possibly the one I'm proudest of a few years ago is when we stopped the, the, the cluster munitions manufacturer for Singapore from manufacturing cluster munitions. Uh, people are safer in the world for that. That's amazing. Demand a sustainable approach. Demand an active approach to the way your money is run, and you can be part of making sure that that's much more routine. So I said I wanted to step up and step back, and this is where we start to do that. I'm sure you're all aware of the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm sure you're all aware that 1% of, of the population owns more than 99%, that there are eight people in the world that own more than half of the world's population, that today the population is 7.65 billion, growing at 200,000 net a day. When Aviva was created in 1692, world population was about 350 million. In 320 odd years, we've grown 15, 16 times. The global economy, over the same duration, has grown 800 times. Not 800%, 800 times. And is forecasted by the investment banks to double, double and double again by 2050. Now, over that duration, the world's carrying capacity for economic activity hasn't changed at all. The one-planet boundary condition has remained constant. 
which is why we're now seeing the likes of the WWF Living Planet Index, which came out a few weeks ago, say that, roughly speaking, of the world's um, wildlife population, stock population stock numbers has decreased on average by 60%. 60%. Also, you'll be aware that roughly half of the world's coral reefs have gone since 1980, that 40% of the world's agricultural resource base is considered distressed, that 80% of the world's fisheries are considered also significantly distressed. These social and environmental problems are economic ones too. It's led directly, particularly the, the climate change issue and the issues of social inequality, have led directly to political unrest. They've led to demagogues, being elected, They've, it's led directly to the trade war that we see today, which is suppressing international valuations. So all of this stuff is a complicated, it's an interdependent, complicated world, as I learnt doing my PhD. And Roland um, and Volta were always very, very clear that you, in order to understand sustainability, you need a multidisciplinary approach. I hadn't realised then how true that was, but it is absolutely the case ethics, law, philosophy, a whole world of geology and environment. It's, it's incredibly sophisticated. So these are the UN Sustainable Development Goals. They are the world's biggest market failures. It's the UN Key Performance Indicators for 2030. Now, one of the things that we've learned over the recent while... Can I just check how much time I've got left? It's about 50, a little while left. Um, what I've learned in the last um, few years in... We produced this document in 2014, a roadmap for sustainable capital markets. It was intended to teach the UN policymakers how the capital markets work, how they undermine sustainable development, and how we would change them to correct it. It taught me that hardly anyone in the UN understands capital markets. That's not just true of the UN, incidentally. That's also true of most politicians and policymakers I ever meet. So I'm not, I'm not saying... I'm not blaming the UN here, but because hardly anyone has been taught how finance works, trying to understand how it relates to sustainability at this macro level is a massive challenge. We have a lack of civil society oversight of the system, which is a really big problem. They're considered to, NGOs are considered to be amongst the civil regulators in society, but if, you know, if I used to work at WWF, if the NGOs are not understanding how this system works, how can they oversee it? How can they hold us to account? So there's, it's, it suits people in the system very well, by the way, but it doesn't suit the long term of, uh, it doesn't suit our own long term interests. So please, if you feel like downloading that roadmap, it's for free on our website. We turned it into a, a policy toolkit for the European Commission. This is back uh, about four years ago. And you, if you Google sustainable finance policy toolkit, you'll get this page. And then if you want to click around on it, you'll find there's this diagram. And this is the one I mentioned earlier that I'd like you all to go away with, this one thing. So if you can imagine, as an individual, hopefully you don't look quite with these colours, but your money is, goes into the stock exchange, goes into companies, listed companies, via two principal routes. We've talked about institutional investment, pension schemes, for example, or insurance companies. We touched a bit on retail financial advice, so you as individuals. So your money ends up in these companies by this process. In the UK, pension trustees use investment consultants to choose a fund manager. We make buy, sell and hold decisions with your money on the companies I showed you at the beginning and thousands of others. And those companies, if they're listed, it means they're on a stock exchange. But of course, they aren't. If private equity is off a stock exchange. And corporate debt, they often are listed as well, but they might come to us direct for a loan. And the sell-side broker, the Goldman Sachs's, the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch's, the Citibank's, even HSBC and Barclays, they have uh, brokerages too. They advise the finance director in this company how to minimise their cost of capital, how to raise money cheaply from the markets. If you think about a mortgage, you can buy a bigger house if the interest rates are lower. You can afford a bigger house. Very similar if you're a finance director. You can grow your business quicker if your cost of capital is lower. At the moment, Kraft has a lower cost of capital than Unilever. 
That is the wrong way round if you want to think about their sustainability performance. Craft, we published a ranking on, on Monday afternoon. Craft does really badly on human rights disclosure. Unilever does brilliantly. It should be Unilever taking over Craft if capitalism was working. So this, this is how your money flows around the world and around the UK. And as you will have seen, people are on both sides here. So individuals also work for companies. I work for a listed company. Just to blow your mind a bit, I work for a company that's an asset owner, an asset manager, and listed on a stock exchange, and has workers that also have pensions that goes back in the system. So you see how it starts to fit together. Another one to think about, if, I touched on incentives earlier. Stock exchanges, obviously, make money every time a stock is exchanged. That's how they do business. When the London Stock Exchange was created in 1802, it was you as an individual would walk to the exchange and you would get a share certificate and you would, work, you would walk home. You knew what you owned. Over the last few hundred years, you've had this intermediation that means very few of you know now what you own. And you certainly, very few of you, turn up at the AGM and ask questions. I know that's not true of all of you. I'd like it to be, you, you, you should all be shareholder activists, not just Philip. Now, we see here a massive opportunity to restructure the way the system works today, to look at incentives, to look at business models. If you're a stock exchange in 1802, you're a quasi-governmental institution. Today, you've, gone to, you've, turned, you've become a for-profit business listed on your own stock exchange, and you've made your directors focus on earnings per share and total shareholder return, and therefore their interests are about getting stocks to be exchanged more. So you've taken what was a regulator and you've turned it to a machine for short-termism. Now that's a little bit extreme, and it's not quite fair, because they also do a lot of other things too, but it isn't entirely untrue, and there's no sophisticated policy conversation about that. I could also point to the pay of fund managers. I could also point to the pay of investment consultants. I could also point particularly to the conflicts of interest on the sell side. If you are Goldman Sachs and you are BP's broker, you're obviously going to recommend to us as fund managers to buy them. There are huge conflicts of interest in the system. We actually did a survey last year where we interviewed 500, we privately interviewed 500 people who work here and ask them, do you feel conflicted? Do you feel able to look at the long term? 90, 90% of the responses said they do feel commercially conflicted and said they would rewrite the broken note if there was a commercial conflict of interest. 90% of the system. So to get sustainability into the system, we need to make sure the real economy internalizes the externalities in the economic jargon. We need to get the pay and business models of the system right. We need to make sure that it's possible for sustainable companies to secure capital better than the unsustainable one so they can out-compete in the market. That's how the market should work. You should have a lower cost of capital if you're more sustainable. Um, in order for that to happen, we need systemic transparency. Hardly in. The whole debate about corporate sustainability reporting focuses here. But what about the investment banks, the stock exchanges, the fund managers, and the asset owners? How transparent are they in their sustainability performance? We need to make sure that, is, that that debate kind of surges forwards. We need standards for sustainable finance. The British Standards Institute has just started building one. Um, and we also need to make sure there is sustainable demand for sustainable finance by changing the national curriculum. Those are the seven tests, by the way, that we gave the United Nations as to how the SDGs could be considered sustainable. Unfortunately, there was only one goal, 12.6, in the SDGs that related to this at all. That was all about disclosure. The Addis Ababa Action Agenda has a lot more in it. And if you look at the UN's recent sustainable finance strategy, you'll see actually some really good stuff that does start talking about demand. What it doesn't do, though, is take the corporate transparency, which was supposed to be an accountability mechanism. Can I ask you, please, another show of hands, have you read a, a sustainability report by a company and you read it not for intellectual academic reasons and not because you were professionally paid to do it, but because you are actually genuinely interested in the sustainability report? Could you put your hand up? Okay, that's an unusual audience. Good for you. Good for you. Typically, a couple of hands go up, even in 
a room like this. So this is exceptionally good. Still only roughly a third of you. Um, now, corporate reporting was supposed to be a window so that society could hold businesses to account. It's actually more of a mirror for the board to see what the rest of the business is doing. And, uh, and because so few people normally read these things, we believe it's time to create accountability through this transparency. What we've helped, we've worked with three other institutions to help um, create the World Benchmarking Alliance, which we, which we launched at the UN General Assembly with support from the UK government, the Dutch and the Danish government. We've got a whole raft of allies. You'll recognize many of these logos, like Oxfam and WWF, the Chamber of Commerce, the, the, not the US Chamber of Commerce, the International Chamber of Commerce. Those of you that know the US Chamber of Commerce will know that it's the devil incarnate when it comes to sustainability. Um, interestingly, uh, its spend in the last 10 years is about a billion. Spending a billion dollars on lobbying is tough. That's a lot of lunches. <laughs> so we've got an alliance that's building this world benchmarking alliance that will produce free <coughs> league tables ranking the world's largest 2,000 companies on how they're impacting on the sustainable development goals. In the last year, we've consulted in a couple of dozen countries. We've had over 10,000 responses from 143 countries around how the World Benchmarking Alliance should look. We've been ranking, we've been building a few benchmarks too. There's one that we've just published on human rights. Some of you will know the RUGGY framework on business and human rights, which takes the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and turns it into something that businesses can apply. The UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Professor Ruggie at the Kennedy School wrote them, hence the name. It was principles, though, not law, and it wasn't practice, and it wasn't an assessment. So we took the principles and in the last five years have built a benchmark with 500 other institutions who care about business and human rights, and that benchmark is now a free public good that we have helped fund, so have the Dutch and the British government, and we've recently published a, a second ranking, um, and the Financial Times covers this stuff, and as they do, as we affect change as owners of these companies, the likes of Starbucks and Prada and Hermes are under more and more pressure to actually improve. Now, in the last, the last report, Adidas got a 25% higher score. So did Vale. So, and when we were told by these companies that they're using the framework of the corporate human rights benchmark to change. Going forwards, of course, the sustainable development goals, there are 17 goals, 169 Targets, 256 indicators. Now, we've, we need to make some sense of that. They were written by countries for countries, not for companies, but clearly companies have a role in, in delivering them. They should do. Now, we're, we're looking for how you categorize those SDGs that you see along the bottom and how do we use these things to build s systems change. But the four issues that we're going to be building next, gender diversity, not just board gender, diversity, by the way, which has come a long way in the UK in the last five years. We're now at least, at last week, the Hampton Alexander Review shows that we've just got over 30% of women on the boards on the average of average FTSE 100 company, which is good change. Why isn't it half? Um, and we're seeing also the executive committees come through, but the, 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 uh, the gender diversity, gender equality target talks about female genital mutilation, it talks about child marriages, it talks about the role of women in the workforce and in the agricultural system. It's not enough to be looking just at the board. We need to look up the supply chain and down how the distribution is working to make sure that gender equality in all its forms is, de is delivered. So we're building a benchmark on that. We're also looking at climate action. Some of you will know the Financial Stability Board has a task force on climate change. Very proud to serve on that. And it is delivering recommendations for how companies should disclose their climate risks. And there is, there's over 500 companies that have now pledged to use that framework. We're going to build a benchmark around that and publicly hold companies to account. There are other issues that we're going to be working on too. So what next? I would like to imagine a world in which you can see in your smartphone, what do you own? How is it performing financially? Because that's why you own it. Then how is it performing on the sustainable development goals? How is your money shaping your world? And then perhaps how was your vote used on your behalf at the last AGM? 
I want to reconnect individuals to their money. Roll back to 1802, sorry to put it quite like that, because it sounds like regression, but w I want you to know actually what you own, like you would have done a few hundred years ago. No, show you using fintech and distributed ledger technology and this kind of equipment now, which pretty much all of you will have in your pocket, why, what you own, how it's shaping the world, and how you can hold us to account for shaping the world that you wish to retire into. There's loads that we can talk about. Um, I think I've either just about overdone my 45 minutes or we're getting close to it. So I'm very happy to take questions. Walter. Thanks. Um, am I, can you hear me? Um, good. Right, first of all, thank you very much. I mean, this is the usual mixture of inspiration and, and, and vision and, and um, um, many, many other parts. Um, the thing that, that strikes me is that you're, um, in the preparation of this, I, I, was, I, was, I was trying to find a couple of interesting pictures of you sort of 15, 20 <laughs> years ago, um, oh just, no. just to make sure I, I, can, I can put the right context here. Um, to be honest, there were two reasons why I eventually didn't do this. Um, one is um, I found a picture of myself um, <laughs> 20 years ago with a moustache and a 1970s um, tie, and then that really didn't work out. Um, and then secondly, you're still the better looking one, so that didn't <laughs> work out. Um, but I think I, I still would like to go back um, with, with one or two observations on this. Um, one is um, I checked out your PhD and I read it again. Um, well, not all of it. Um, <laughs> supervisors never do that, you know. No, that's true. Um, so um, within that, um, you, uh, I mean, the title was um, looking at um, um, NG, um, NGOs um, and equity investment, a critical assessment of the practices of UK NGOs in using the capital markets as a campaign device. So um, this was really about trying to find out um, how NGOs can nudge the capital markets. And I can remember many, many discussions where um, the three of us sat together um, and um, discussed, and uh, you know, Roland and I were consistently trying to narrow down the topic so that this is coming <laughs> into something that is smaller and manageable and actually delivers a, a contribution to the body um, of knowledge. And you stubbornly refused that. Um, and um, that made, made all the PhD ex uh, exercises we had really interesting, but also quite challenging and nerve-wracking for all of us. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for um, those gray hairs. Um, <laughs> and then within all of the, the, the accolades, I can, I can still say, and I'm sure I'm speaking for, um, for Roland here as well, that um, it's kind of nice to listen, to, uh, that, that um, we might have done something nice in the past, but at the end of the day, it's all your fault nonetheless. So we are still, still sticking there. Um, the conclusion, or one of the conclusions he came up with, was that, um, and, and I quote, um, page 296, um, NGOs in general were, f um, were found to have an underdeveloped understanding of the machinery of the capital markets. Um, the uh, further conclusions he had there was actually they need to get far better in understanding the capital markets, understanding where the power is they have and how they can effectively use that, but they have got no particular understanding and no particular process on how to learn how to come, become better. Um, and I thought this was interesting because we are now, t um, um, we've now listened to quite a compelling argument um, that says if people are believing strongly about sustainability and about the um, need to introduce sustainability in every, everything we do, then actually the first part we um, have to enact with are the capital money, uh, markets because, as you said so many times, it's our market, uh, it's, it's our money that, that we are investing within that. Um, and then therefore, um, your, your compelling argument is towards greater financial literacy. Um, and I think this is an interesting one because despite all of the huge arguments about the massive global change that, that we have to have, um, about the trillions that, that could be wasted, about the, the fundamental risks that we have, um, at the end of the day, it can boil down to individual decisions of individual people. And I think that juxtaposition um, about the individual and the global change, I think, has gone through throughout your argument and I think, in a way, throughout your campaign. Um, and um, that's, that's a fantastic thing. I think before we um, conclude um, proceedings, I think for um, the closure of, of our um, session, I think it's only appropriate 
to give Roland Clift um, the benefit of the last question, oh, given um, that uh, this is the Roland Clift lecture. Yeah. And yeah. I know it's so difficult to, to shut you up anyway, so <laughs> there we go. Um, <laughs> yes, okay, I'll, I, I'm, I'm very severely tempted to jump in on the biomass issue. Let me say I've come here probably further than anyone else. I've come from British Columbia. Uh, where I work on the utilization of biomass. I do actually know a bit about it. But I'm going to park that one um, because I want to ask you something else, Steve. Um, I've had a brief glimpse into your world. Well, not brief, but slight. I was a director of a BlackRock investment fund for about 12 years, um, which was a bit odd. Um, I'm not a natural capitalist. Um, maybe I'm a natural capitalist, anyway. Um, uh, but what struck me was that the directors were actually extremely influential, yes. but not regulated. Yes. Now, the board I was on, I came to have a great deal of respect for them. My job as the technician, it was an energy investment fund, and my job as the sort of technical member of the board was to make sure they didn't invest in perpetual motion machines. I mean, it amazed me the number of investment <laughs> propositions that came up that were thermodynamically cloud cuckoo land. So I screened those out. I also dealt with people who objected to certain investments on grounds which were doctrinaire and not necessarily well informed. So I was occasionally wheeled in um, to explain to a, an investor why uh, his objection was ill-founded. Ill and on at least one occasion, the board stuck with me, even though the investor pulled their money out. I was very impressed by the ethical standards of the board I was engaged in. It also struck me it could easily have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. In your vision for a way forward for capitalism, directors are, I think, going to be important agents. What changes would you see in the way directors are appointed, scrutinized, whatever? Mm -hmm. Just a small one towards the end. <laughs> I'm going to go back to, to answer that question. I'm going to do it in two parts. The, the first part is, um, Roland, to thank you for one of the comments you made on my PhD. I learned two things from the comment. I gave Roland a draft of my PhD that had guilt-edged, misspelt the whole way through it. And I, <laughs> I, I spelt guilt as in G-U-I-L-T. <laughs> So I now know exactly how you spell guilt-edged, and I also found what, well, what the word malapropism meant from the comment that you wrote in the margin 400 <laughs> times the whole way through. So thank you for, for that. Now, the, the question that you're asking, I think, should be extended beyond, I think you were talking about companies, listed companies and the board directors and how influential yeah. they were. Yeah. I think well, I, there are directors the whole way down this chain. Well, these are trustees, but yeah. there are board directors here. So I think if we're to be sustainable, we need to think about how each of them integrates sustainability into their businesses. And then... They're in shadows. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, and, and almost everyone keeps going back here. You know, it's for the company, it's for the company, it's for the company. It's actually as important that these institutions have boards that are properly governed, that think through the long term and work out how that they themselves should think about the interests of broader stakeholders. So how, in, in our vision of, of how we would change that, there's something called the OECD Corporate Governance Principles that underpins all developed market corporate governance standards and codes and so on. At the moment, they're still codes. Um, I think the OECD needs to revisit those principles that, that hardly talk about sustainability at all. They were, they were re written before the SDGs, written before the Paris Agreement. So I think one of the things that I'll be asking Anhel Guria to do in two weeks from now is to update those corporate governance principles so that every standard, every code, ultimately think that makes it clear that it is the role of all the boards to think about that one planet boundary condition mm. and these issues, the human rights, labour standards and business ethics, because it's ultimately the impact of all your money in terms of where it actually har harms or helps isn't here, it's not the noughts and ones that represent the, the money flowing through the system. The, the, the impact is what companies then do with your money to shape the world that you're in. So the vision that we have, we need to make it very, very clear in fiduciary duty what it is, what it means to be a good fiduciary of a company. That's here. Fiduciary duty also exists at this end, where you are a trustee. And we need to, and the Department for Work and Pensions has, in the last month or two, 
made it very clear that as trustees they need to have regard to the interests of the individuals from an ESG perspective. That is actually a huge change. It kicks in in October next year. So that needs to be replicated globally. So for change fiduciary duty, change corporate governance, change standards, ideally also listing rules at, com uh, at stock exchanges. Sorry, Walter, I think I might have just blinded you with a laser. No, that's there we go. Nice. I've got another eye. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, Roland, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak Wonderful. here this evening. Walter, also for the invitation, yes. and Vice-Chancellor, also. I Wonderful. really appreciate Wonderful. it. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Steve, Steve for coming down. Thank you, here. Walter. Um, you're more than welcome any time um, to come here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Walter. I've got something for you. Oh, thank you. Some wow. goodies, yes, yes. Thank you very much. If, if in doubt for Christmas, you know. Thank <laughs> Excellent. You. Thank you very much. Good thank evening. you all for coming. Thank, thank you. you.